in this video, we're going to talk about different policies in order to get to those abatement targets that we talked about in the last video, right? Should we focus on uh, taxes in order to increase the costs um, of pollution and therefore reduce it? Should we focus on regulations telling, you know, businesses and consumers how much they can pollute? Um, or should we focus on some sort of combination of those two? And uh, I think we'll talk about some successes that uh, we've had in the past um, and the specific challenges around uh, climate change uh, specifically, right? So climate change is, is a problem specifically because both it's global and there are so many emitters of greenhouse gases um, in a way that we haven't had with other types of pollution, right? Other types of pollution have been much more specific about uh, who is polluting. So our goal, right, is to reduce some uh, type of pollution, right? And that could be uh, sulfuric acid when we're talking about acid rain, right? Um, so sulfur dioxide that turns into sulfuric acid. Um, it could be, you know, any type of pollution coming out of a factory or a power plant. Um, it could be lead, right? So one of the things that we discovered in the 20th century was, hey, lead is really good at, you know, making some good colors and paint and uh, making engines run smoothly, but, oh, it turns out it's really, really bad for us. And so we need to get rid of it. Um, in the case of lead, what we decided to do was to, just to ban it, right? It was just too dangerous. Um, and so we banned lead in the 1970s. Other countries have um, banned lead at different times as well. Um, really because it interferes with brain development uh, in children, especially. So there are really two types of abatement policies, right? One are price-based policies uh, and the other is quantity-based policies. And so with price-based policies, what we're talking about usually is, is what economists call a Pigovian tax, right? Named after Cecil Pigou. And there, the idea is we have some externality, right? Some cost or benefit uh, associated with a market transaction that's not getting internalized into that market price. And what we need to do is put a tax uh, on an external uh, cost or a, a subsidy on an external benefit in order to get the market to produce the right amount. And so this is one of the most common suggestions by economists when it comes to greenhouse gases is to put a tax on carbon, is to figure out, all right, well, what is our best estimate of the cost of every extra ton of carbon that gets uh, put into the atmosphere, whether it's through uh, carbon dioxide or methane, and then put a tax on those activities. And so then that tax would filter through to uh, gasoline, um, to beef, to energy, and it would provide an incentive for the market to come up with alternatives, right? And so it would also provide an incentive for people to do less of whatever activity was producing the carbon uh, in the first place. So it would provide an incentive for people to drive less, for people to drive more fuel efficient cars, for people to drive electric cars. It would provide an incentive for people to eat less meat. Um, all of that would be captured as long as the tax was put at the right amount. Um, and so you can see the sort of the, uh, the benefit of this type of tax. Uh, Quantity-based policies are more about either putting a cap on the amount, banning it outright as we did with lead, um, or other types of regulations, right? So we've uh, regulated power plants in terms of, you know, having to put different types of scrubbers on in order to reduce pollution. Um, and those can sometimes be effective, um, but they also require a lot more um, regulation, right? Because you have to keep uh, coming back and, and making sure that they're, they're not doing it. I think when things need to be banned, right, that's, that's a lot more clear. Um, there's also a sort of combination here in terms of cap and trade. Uh, there's some economic research that shows cap and trade is really most similar to uh, a tax, um, but it, it really feels like a combination of um, both a price and quantity uh, regulation. And the idea here is that you put a, a cap on how much pollution, um, how much 
you know, whether it's carbon dioxide or this worked especially well um, for sulfur dioxide um, when we were dealing with acid rain. Um, and then allocate permits in order to uh, pollute to whoever is polluting, right? And so it worked well, I think, with sulfur dioxide because there were only so many um, power plants that were producing a large amount of sulfur dioxide. And, uh, and then what you can do is you can cap it and then you can have that cap uh, fall over time. And the idea is for those entities that can reduce their pollution below the amount that they have a permit for, they can sell that extra permit to somebody else. And so they have a financial incentive uh, to do that. Um, it, it can work quite well. Um, it can create a market in terms of the price of uh, pollution. Um, you can reduce the, the limit over time, as I said, and so that can uh, reduce the amount of pollution. But it, it does require um, government to be pretty smart about, about the sizes, and we'll see that in just a minute. Um, but here's, here's a little example here where on our horizontal axis, we have uh, the amount of abatement we want, right? So whether that's carbon dioxide, in this case, sulfur, sulfur dioxide. Um, and then we have two firms, firm A and firm B. And the idea is just that they have different marginal costs of abatement, right? In this case, firm A has a better technology or is more able to uh, reduce carbon dioxide at a lower cost. And so their marginal um, private cost of abatement is this red line. And then firm B, the blue line is this is firm B's marginal private cost of abatement. And even if they have uh, an initial split of permits at 50-50 right here, then uh, firm A will sell some of their permits to firm B uh, and we'll end up at point X where, you know, it looks like firm A has uh, reduced about two thirds of the abatement and firm B has uh, reduced about one third. And overall, we've gotten to that total amount of abatement that we wanted. Um, it's just that we've allowed the uh, firm with the better technology to take advantage of that and even profit off of that. Um, and so that, you know, from a, from a social point of view, we're at actually a better place, right? Because we've abated the amount that we wanted but at a lower cost. So as we said, you know, this requires policymakers to set the correct total level of abatement, um, which is not always easy to determine. Um, one of the things that the uh, European Union found was they had uh, too large of a cap on, on their um, carbon dioxide and, and it didn't provide enough of an incentive because the price to pollute was just too low, right? You, you didn't have, you wanted the price to be higher so that firms would have an incentive to make investments in technology um, in order to reduce pollution. But it turned out, you know, the prices were too low over here in 2013 to 2015. They could just buy those permits and that was cheaper than investing in the technology. So in this case, what you'd really want to do is to reduce those caps, right? You just pass a new law and say, okay, we're, you know, reducing those caps by 25% or 30%, whatever you think it would be in order to get that price back up in order to provide the incentives um, to uh, reduce pollution. So one important question is how valuable is a clean environment, right? If we think of a, a clean environment is, is the be all and end all of what we want, then we would just go back to you know hunting and gathering and unfortunately we would not be able to support all 7.7 .7 billion of us but that would be the way it is but obviously that's not generally what we think right we think okay well we we value a clean environment we need a clean environment but how clean is clean um and we also need to be able to feed and house and clothe everybody um, how valuable is being able to fly places? How valuable is being able to ship things from, uh, you know, all around the world? How valuable is it to be able just to pick up and drive, um, you know, across the country? So we need to come up with ways to value um, the environment, uh, both in terms of costs and benefits. And there's really two ways to do this in economics. Neither one is perfect. Um, one is contingent valuation, which is basically just asking people, right? How much would you be willing to pay for X, right? For this amount of reduction in air pollution or water pollution or this amount of increased green space. 
Um, and then, you know, you have a survey of, you know, 100 people or 1,000 people, and you just scale that up, um, assuming that it's a random sample. I think many economists are, are somewhat skeptical of this uh, methodology because people don't always have real money on the line. You can do, you know, you can look at certain instances where that might not be the case, where, for instance, there might be a, um, a referendum vote that says, all right, are you willing to increase taxes by this amount in order to do this? And then so, OK, if people vote for it and they're saying, yes, you can act, you can increase my taxes. Uh, by a certain amount in order to, you know, improve, um, you know, our water or air. Um, so, but overall, I think that's a, a difficult way to, to come up with a, a valuation. Another way is hedonic pricing. Um, and so with hedonic pricing, uh, basically, you're trying to look at how much people value something through a re regression analysis. And so, for instance, there was some recent research done here at the University of Rhode Island about the effect of a solar farm on housing prices. And so they looked at a whole bunch of housing prices and their distance from uh, solar farms and found that there was a slight decrease in uh, housing values um, due to solar farms. Again, this is you know, that's a cost, right? So that you're, you're taking the cost in, but then you also have to, as a policymaker, think about the benefit of, for instance, having those solar farms um, and reducing pollution. Um, so I think, you know, you, these are neither one perfect. Um, I think you can also look at things like, like health costs. Um, you can look at like health, um, not just costs, but sort of outcomes, right? Like if pollution causes people to not develop as well, um, to earn lower income, uh, to be more violent, as was the case with lead, uh, then those are big costs that you also want to take into account that don't really come into either contingent valuation or hedonic pricing. 